I've been working in the motion picture industry for over 35 years now on over 40 feature films. Very fortunate to have worked on the Star Wars series, Jurassic Park series, Terminator series, Matrix series, a lot of the big franchises. My name is Fawn Davis. I am production designer on Gods of Mars and the founder of Fonco Studios. We do everything from design and development through photography, but we specialize in the unusual. We do a lot of robotics and we do creatures, we do miniatures and crazy special effects. It's become a place to come for the things you can't get anywhere else. Gods of Mars is about the colonization of Mars gone horrifically wrong because people are involved. <laughs> you know, like most science fiction, I guess. On the production design side, there's a lot of spacecraft, there's robots, there's all the exciting things that I love to design. You know, we're making this movie at the epicenter of so many new technologies. In the design process, we're using 3D printing, we're using 3D scanning, we're using all the cutting edge software. The Stratasys J55 fits into our workflow as the ideal printer. We're getting really high quality parts, some of the best quality parts I've ever seen, but now they have combined that quality with printing and color. And that's a huge game changer. Take that darker green. Yeah, green. just a little, just a pinch darker, Take not a whole lot. Bit. Okay. Yeah, because this is about perfect. So we want this to be darker and that to be darker. Okay. And then we'll print it and then we'll see what that looks like. And I think it'll be perfect. What happens is Elliot cleans up the model and applies the texture and geometric data. And we import it into GrabCAD and we have all the color and the textures like all the rust and all the, the bumps and the bolts and everything. These printers are great because they actually print in CYMK, so you can get Pantone accurate colors. You know, when I work with that machine, I could tell that's the future of 3D printing for sure. I was looking at this helmet and I thought, you know, we could do a lot better. This is a science fiction movie. We took advantage of the fact that we have all these tools at our disposal and we very rapidly changed the design of this helmet. The first thing we did is we did a 3D scan of this with the Artec EVA scanner. It's taking photos 11 frames per second. As I rotate around, it's compiling all those images together to give us a really high definition 3D model with both the color and the texture. So the scan data comes in as point cloud data, which it converts to polygons. And now what I can do is take this and simplify it and make it into a cleaner mesh that's easier to work with. With the Cintiq, it's really easy to do in Maya. Then from there, I went on and I created this back piece, which has all kinds of little details in it. And all this was extracted exactly from the original helmet. So now we have these parts that can be exported and printed on the J55. And this is a compound curve. This is one of the most complex shapes you can try to adapt a part to, and they fit flawlessly. So we're able to just power through this design very quickly. In the next pass, we'll probably print them in color. Once we glued all the parts on, we did the paint job. That was it. We had our new helmet for the movie. I think this technology just, as an artist, frees you up to focus on the art. To have that repeatability, to have that accuracy, those are all things that eliminate the need to mold and cast parts. It eliminates the need to do finish work on parts. That's a big deal. So the technology doesn't put people out of work, it just elevates the quality of our work. You know, so don't be afraid. <laughs> The marriage between Stratasys and Fonco Studios is a good one because they are an innovator. They're pushing their technology to the limit and that's exactly what we need to do. It's exactly what we do every day. Bye for now. Well, good morning, good day, and good afternoon. And thanks for joining us from wherever you are. Today, I've got Colton Mulhoff from Stratasys and myself, Joe Sliger from Wacom, as well as two amazing artists joining us today. Peter Hiaguchi, a film director, visual effects supervisor, founder and CEO of Ronin Films, specializing in virtual production, 
and currently in production on Gods of Mars. Gods of Mars has been awarded two epic mega grants and is being produced by Ronin Film, partnering with Fonko. Gods of Mars is pioneering the method of digitally scanning practical miniatures for use in the Unreal Engine to create hyper-realistic CGI. Higuchi started his career at 15 years old when he won the George Lucas Youth Film Festival for his short sci-fi called A Future's Future. At 18, he directed his first feature film, an adaptation of the play No Exit, and has been making films ever since. In 2000, Peter wrote and directed First, Last, and Deposit, which won Best Feature Film at both the New York and San Francisco Independent Film Festivals. The picture was distributed by many platforms, including Netflix and IFC. Higuchi has directed five features, hundreds of shorts, as well as pilots, commercials, and documentaries. Ronin Film Virtual Production headlines NAB Creative Masters Conference, Virtual Production, The Renaissance of Filmmaking. October 13th, 2021 in Las Vegas. Colton? Also joined by Fawn Davis. And Fawn Davis has worked for on over 30 feature films over the last 20 years. While working at ILM's model shop, Fawn worked on features such as Star Wars, Pearl Harbor, Starship Troopers, Galaxy Quest, Terminator 3, Mission Impossible 3, and The Matrix series. In addition to his work in visual effects, Fawn has also worked in Disney's art departments as a concept designer, model maker, and on several stop motion projects, including The Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline. More recently, Fawn worked on Interstellar, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Ellipsum. Fawn is a creative director at Fonco, a celebrity judge on ABC's BattleBots, instructor at the Stan, uh, Stan Winston School, and a guest host for a number of other shows, as well as his own projects. Fawn is here to talk about the art and craft of model making for cinema, for concept design to hybrid, practical, and computer graphics and visual effects with a particular expertise and knowledge where models and miniatures can play a role in today's digital world. And speaking of digital world, I'm sure we're all familiar with online meetings and events like this. For some quick housekeeping, just know that we would like for you to add any questions you have during the course of this conversation to the chat, and we'll come back and curate those questions at the end, as well as a little special surprise for those who actually have attended this event. We will be doing a live giveaway as well. So uh, with that, Colton. I want to thank both of you for joining us. And to start out, um, Peter, can you tell us a bit about uh, yourself and Ronan Film? Sure. So Fawn and I are kind of cut from the same cloth. We're sort of children of George Lucas in, in a strange way. We both have our own independent companies. Uh, his company is Fawn Co., which does everything. And um, mine is uh, Ronan Film. And um, you know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards writing and directing um, and, uh, and now visual effects uh, with the Unreal Engine, um, but I've always been a, f a, a huge fan of miniatures, tactile, real, actual uh, creativity when it comes to making effects in films, and just a huge fan of Fawn just as a person and as an artist. Uh, I think he's the best miniature maker in the business, and he's also a director in his own right. So that might be a great transition to uh, Fawn. Can you tell us a bit more about Fonco yourself and, and really how you pick up this creation? Uh, yeah, Fonco basically is a company that I started while I was working for Industrial Light and Magic and Disney and um, you know a lot of different uh, bigger companies. And it was just a place for a bunch of us to go between feature films. And then the, the span of time between feature films started to grow more and more in the Bay Area. That was before I'd uh, made the good move to Los Angeles. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it started as just a shop in my basement, just doing miniatures. And then we started doing miniatures and design. And then because they kind of go hand in hand. And then we uh, ended up at a certain point realizing we, we were designing everything. We were building everything and delivering it to a stage. And I knew everyone on those stages. So we built a stage. <laughs> and so we just started doing uh, full production. But our specialty at Fonco has always been, um, you know, that place where technology and traditional art meet. That's awesome. Uh, and 
I had one one question that's very self-serving. I'll be the first to admit before we dive into digging deeper into the technology. Yes, we use Wacom for every single element of this production. <laughs> I it, and yeah, I mean it. It I, I use it constantly. Um, Fawn uses it constantly. We all use it for different reasons. Like Fawn and his artists, they're using it really you know the most rich way that you can then you can use the the tablet so as a, as a good segue into talking about the technology that that you guys have used and kind of the evolution and so fun if you wouldn't mind jumping in uh you know as the uh visual effects movies started to evolve in the 90s what happened is uh you know we used to do like you know like jurassic park has 65 visual effects shots, something like that. A lot of people don't know it's that few. Um, and then you get into other movies, it's maybe 150 or, you know, that was a pretty sizable feature film at the time. Uh, it, but then we started to do movies with 300, with 500, with 900. And the next thing though, it was uh, up over 3000 and we stopped counting. Uh, the, the amount of visual effects shots in a movie went like this on a curve, but budgets for movies went more, you know, like this. So what that meant is every single department in feature films had to find a more efficient way of doing everything that they do to keep up with the pace of visual effects. Um, and the, ways, the way the model shop did it at ILM is we integrated uh, CNC machines, laser cutters, the 3D scanner. Uh, we, uh, we developed the pipeline to work closer with every single department. So they would do animatics in the, um, at the ranch they would send us, they used to send us those uh, animatics on VHS. Oh. <laughs> um, but we were like, no, give us the computer files because then we can use the computer models. We could use the camera moves. So they were porting out the camera moves from the Maya uh, animatic. We were taking the um, rough computer models. We would look, uh, elaborate on those. We would work with the CG department. We'd share data between art department, CG department, model shop, and stage. And that just tied all of the departments together in a way that had never happened before Attack of the Clones. Um, and that allowed us to work a lot faster. Um, and then because we, we were able to work faster, that bought us more time and practical effects. And that keeps going to this day. As long as we're integrating technology, becoming uh, better and faster and doing that higher quality work that the, that the higher resolutions of video now are really uh, accelerating, um, that's 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 been how we survive in this this end of the industry, and it's actually what's driven the industry to make such incredible motion pictures. The exciting thing that we have happening now is that that same technology that we've used on feature films is now accessible to uh, lower budget projects. That's that's going to be the real big game changer, you know, because right now movies are being made that are you know in the hundreds of millions. Um, and only, only the big motion picture companies can do a movie like that. So we've lost some of like Orion Pictures made a lot of the best science fiction fantasy movies we, we grew up with, uh, wouldn't be able to survive with the appetite for visual effects that we have now without this technology. Who else is on set? I mean, and are you using these on the virtual production sets? We haven't really talked about the big move to the virtual productions as mm -hmm. much, but, um, are you using the tablets and the and the Cintiqs actually on on the virtual production floors? There's something called the Brain Bar, which is the the people who run the wall. And uh, there's a there's a number of things that have to be done. One is uh, the maintaining of the wall, um, the the actual physical wall, and then there's the person who people are calling them drivers, uh, but they're basically driving the engine, um, the Unreal project file and sizing it to and placing the, the the 3d camera in the physical space and then there's a color there's an onset color correctionist um so now i think they're all using the the the, uh, uh, the the wacom um and then there's um um then there's a lighting tech so that's like physical lighting and you know fawn can speak can can speak to that virtual production and regular um, traditional production is a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the work is done in pre-production rather than done in post or done on stage. So um, 
you know, so that's that's why we're hogging all the cool toys. Yeah, every every show <laughs> in I mean, our department. <laughs> people think about virtual production; they think about the wall, but there's tremendous amount of work that has to be done before you even get on stage. Uh, every single scene, every single shot has to be already created already. So there's a there's a level of first create all the environments, kind of in a in a low um, poly way, like a kind of like a rough way, and then. Uh, as a director, I go into that environment and choose my angles. And then we cut that together with an editor uh, with sort of like temporary voice actors. So creating an animatic, right? So pre-visualization. And then I have these like sort of dummies, CG dummies that are in the Unreal Engine that represent where the actors are going to be. And so we cut it together with sound effects and music. And then it's like, okay, then... Fawn and I have a discussion about how can we make those angles look the best because we don't really need to we won't see any of the anything else so then, then it's just about putting a lot of love either uh, we need to make a physical prop sometimes there'll be a physical prop that will be uh, an actor will touch and then we need it to be in the set later on where it's digital and it needs to look exactly the same so there's a lot of that back and forth where something is either created digitally or created physically, and then it has to live in both virtual and reality worlds, and they have to match. And so, um, so we're putting a lot of love on those shots to make them look the way they're going to look. So by the time we get to the set and we're actually on the wall, all of, a lot of the creative decisions have already been made. And uh, we know exactly what shots, what angles, everything, what needs to be physically bu uh, built, what needs to be printed what needs to be not printed and all those decisions. So you basically make your entire movie first in a sort of temporary way that you won't show anyone because it's embarrassing, but because uh, <laughs> there's no actors in it, it's just mannequins, you know? Uh, so, uh, and then you use that to make your movie and just swap out the shot, the old shot with the new shot until you've got a finished movie. So when you're done filming, it's weird, you know, it used to be you'd film and then a year of post-production. Now it's kind of like a year of pre-production and then you shoot it and then you're just done, you know? It's, it's been very exciting. You know, and now we're able to, um, you know, with the Unreal Engine, we're able to um, take objects, create them very quickly um, in, in real, real space. <laughs> And then 3D scan them or use photogrammetry to bring those into the computer and then into Unreal. Uh, for Gods of Mars, uh, we were able to really dive into um, some of the specific needs that we have in motion pictures. Like, um, you know, we have hero models, we have non-hero models. And sometimes we have different ways of, of developing those things in physical reality. So we did something that mirrored that in computer technology. We would take um, a for for the the Banshee, uh, which is one of the main spacecrafts in the movie. We um, modeled it into the computer first, and then we three D printed it, and then we did a very elaborate paint job on it with all the weathering and tactile finishes and things like that. And then we used photographs of that miniature to bring it back into uh, the computer. So that way the, the computer model has the elements of reality that we can, we can generate in reality without um, you know, the, the perfection of computer technology. Um, we call it taking the curse off. <laughs> um, kind of full circle, that's, that's amazing, that's cool. Yeah, and then for some, some of the uh, miniatures that were more background, we create those 100% reality and we use photogrammetry to bring those into Unreal. You know, so there's different techniques for different um, needs, just like there are in physical uh, production. Um, so it's been, you know, that's that's been a very exciting part of all of this processes, all of these processes, is um, again just finding ways to connect dots. You know, um, the ability to have a color calibrated monitor like the Wacom and the Stratasys color 3D printing is also propelling us in uh, the ability to do um, our work in the art department. So now we can, we can come up with a design, we can see it on the screen, we can color print that, and then we can show that to Peter. You know, we're, we're, we're actually excited. We want to do a lot more than we have done. Um, but just even getting answers at the very early stages of production has been, uh, you know, really, really helped by combining all these technologies.
I see the question kind of evolving from Fawn to Peter and the importance of being able to, to produce something digitally and, and <laughs> know that the colors were going to translate into a, a product that you could show Peter and maybe talk a little bit about how, like, how that process is both better, faster, and, and obviously more efficient. Like I, from, a, from a director's point of view, the color is like a note for a musician. So color has, there are color themes and a color palette that we, that we go over really thoroughly before we even start the process. And Fawn is more than a miniature creator, he's a production designer. So that's part of his job is to come up with a color scheme. Colors have meaning for different characters and different uh, hierarchies and emotion, and they have to be consistent it's like create. It's like if I wrote a piece of music, and these are the songs. These are the notes that have to be played, and they have to be in in, in every part. So, like, say something is digital, right? Like a digital model, and then we have a physical prop on set um, that has to match exactly. It's like they all have to work in harmony, just like an orchestra has to have the tuba has to be in tune and the flute has to be in tune. And if they're playing the, the same song, but they're out of tune, it doesn't work. And the same thing is for color. These colors have to be rock solid in tune throughout every iteration of the movie uh, or it doesn't work. And the illusion is blown. It's just like hearing a bad note. It's like, ow, you know? That's so eloquently put. Thank you. And Fawn, did you, did you do the color calibration and, and was there a color calibration workflow or process that you actually used for the Cintiqs? Yeah, we, we did the color calibration um, on the monitors. And then uh, we also worked with uh, Stratasys for um, the printers. And so, yeah, so now we're at a point now where everything we see on the screen is exactly what we get out of the printer, which is exactly what we require. Talk to me a little bit about the color workflow and how it impacted um, you know, moving from a, a color accurate display, modeling and painting and everything and going straight to a product that you could physically hold thanks to the Stratasys. Um, on, the, on the development side, it really speeds things up, I think, the most because, uh, you know, we're presenting, um, you know, to, to directors like Peter or to our clients, we're presenting uh, straight from the 3D printer a color representation of what that design is. It used to be that we would develop the three-dimensional aspect of it and the color aspect of it differently. So we would uh, develop 2D art renderings to show the color of what the item would be. And then we would do a 3D print in a single color and you would show them the two and you'd have to use your imagination to kind of combine those things. Or we would additionally uh, need to add the step of painting the 3D print after we printed it. So now we can just go straight from the computer to the 3D print. We show that to client, they buy off on it, and it's eliminated, you know, sometimes often weeks of, of development. So, so we talked about kind of before uh, having specifically Wacom tablets and printers. What's your process for integrating these smoothly into your workflow? Uh, so how do, you, how do you kind of manage that transition and integration? Um, you know, I suffer from what I call early adopter syndrome. <laughs> so we've always been willing to try technology before other companies try the technology because we want to stay ahead of the curve. Um, and that's really paid off, actually. Um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. Also, uh, you know, adopting technology early allows you a better connection to the companies that, that make that technology. So that's been really fun as well. It's been great working with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't even imagine doing what we do today in, in, in under a week, we can design something um, and then be holding it, you know, within days, actually. Um, we, in the film industry, it's very, very challenging. We, we are hit with a lot of really crazy deadlines. We might get a call on a Friday night that they need something on set the following Monday morning, and we can computer model it, print it, you know, do all the finishes and then get it to set Monday morning at 7 a.m. in a different state. And I say this because it just happened recently. <laughs> um, I remember seeing that email from Fawn and Fawn says, hey, you know, I think it was Thursday. And hey, we need these parts, you know, Saturday and it's a little outside of what our, our printer size is. Can you guys make this happen? 
it happens all the time and it's very exciting to be able to respond as quickly as uh, as we can. And it's only it's only possible because of these combined technologies. You know, uh, one of the ways our artists work faster is with the Wacom because, um, you know, we're all familiar with paper. We all grow up draw doing drawings. We all grow up, you know, a lot of our artists used to sculpt. So all of our sculpting is done with Wacom. A lot of our, uh, um, you know, concept art is done with the Wacom tablet um, because it mimics paper and you can, you can, you know, just get very, very detailed. And to be able to do that on the screen is just remarkable. Uh, and that's, you know, because for a long time we had the tablets that we would just kind of hold in our lap and you would approximate where you are on the screen. And I had a button for undo programmed into my Wacom tablet so that I could undo if I did. So I draw, 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 undo, draw, 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 undo, draw, 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 undo. And that just became a technique. So having the now having the Cintiq monitor, you you can get rid of the undo feature. You can just draw. You know, you can just sculpt, and that's that's been a big game changer. So that's brilliant to 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 contrast that, though. I mean, like you, you just talked about this just hyper compressed environment. How long would that have taken prior to your adoption of the three D printers and the Wacom tablets? You know, if you go before three D printing, you know, you would probably physically sculpt the prop in in clay or or fabricate it. Um, that would take several days because it takes longer to, to do things in physical reality, often it does anyway, uh, than it does in the computer, especially since you can mirror things. This is a radial pattern. Uh, can't talk about specifically what it is because of NDAs, but um, you know, uh, something as sophisticated as that prop that we created um, would have taken, I would say a week to sculpt and then a couple days to mold and cast, you know, and then it would get painted and so on. So, you know, you're talking about probably two weeks instead of the three days. It was actually just two full days to create it. So and, we, we've, you and know. And with the new process, with the new process, is it two days of hands-on and one day of machine time, right? Yeah. Or are you printing overnight? Well, it was just another... one, day, one day of machine time and then one day of hand work. And then, and then an airplane. <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> You can well, never get rid of the last day. The last day is always going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm going to jump on Peter. We've, what are the, some of the driving factors for you in, in your changes of, of technology adoption? The big thing for me was the Unreal Engine. I mean, I had been a visual effects supervisor. I'd worked on a couple sci-fi channel movies and um, I had worked on the new kind and we had, uh, I was basically just following the industry standard workflow, which is Maya, Nuke, Houdini, um, After Effects. Uh, these are these are the staples uh, in the entertainment industry for visual effects, and they work great. And so that's what I was doing. And I had my modelers, and I had my generalists, and I had my shaders, and lighters, and riggers, and animators, and compositors, and um, you know, this, these were my teams of people that I would. Uh, put together, and, and there was there was a large a large amount. I mean, we had two hundred over almost three hundred actually artists for 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 working on the new kind. And then when the Unreal Engine came in to the picture, and I realized you could do the same same quality, but um, no rendering. <laughs> I mean, I was paying a lot of money for a render farm, and it would take like the opening shot of the new kind is like a four minute shot, it took two weeks to render that shot. Uh, and um, and I, that same shot I could do with like three guys and it would render in real time now. And, uh, and, it, and to build, we had to build all those models. So that we had all of these restaurants and schools and supermarkets and post offices and street lamps and cars dilapidated and all this stuff. I mean, it took us almost a year to build that world digitally. And then now you can just go onto the, you know, onto CG Trader and just half the stuff's free and you can just assemble it and, um, and light it in real time. I mean, just the lighting would take so long. So everything went to warp speed. That, mean, that meant that essentially most of the people I was working with I had to not work with them anymore um, because they work, they, 
we're talking about hundreds of people, none of them know, know, knew the Unreal Engine. Um, there was one guy from my, uh, from my, uh, from my team, from my uh, CG team that knew the Unreal Engine. And uh, he was like my Sherpa into this new world. And I, I was able to train a lot of my artists to learn Unreal Engine. Um, but it was not easy. And it was like starting from scratch. Like we have to stop everything, put completely put everything on halt, reimagine how to do the pipeline. And, re and as a director, like I had to figure out how to, do, how to direct in this, in this new world. And it took a little bit of time and some things were really easy and fast, like a miracle. And some things were like, why is this like this? Why can't we just do this? You know? And so it, it's not like perfect, but it is, has huge advantages enough for me to just go, I'll never do it that other way again. And um, in terms of our, our technology, you know, I look, really look to my artists to, you know, for, for what computer do you use? You know, what, what monitor do you like? You know, what, what, you know, what tablet are you using? Turns out every single person on the production from the editor to, to the visual effects people, to, um, to Fawn's team, everyone uses the Wacom tablet, everyone, everyone. So uh, it's, uh, that was sort of an easy thing. And then it was sort of like, what was the dream? What was the dream list? Well, we wanted, the, and so we just asked everybody, you know, what's the dream list of what would you like? And uh, Stratasys was on the top of Fawn's list of uh, what would he would want, you know? And it's, it's uh, you know, magnitudes beyond what's out there right now. And unless you're really in the world, it doesn't make sense. It's like, well, it prints color, so what, you know? But it's a huge game changer. And for anyone who's in the world that Fawn is in, it's like, you know, it's a rocket ship as opposed to a Toyota. I know it's changed the way he does his work. And one of the interviews, Fawn, that we did with you when we sent a news crew out, you said that this technology frees you up to focus on the art. So can you say a bit more about what you mean by frees you up to, to focus on the art? Yeah, I mean, as an artist, you know, um, what we're always looking for is a seamless use of technology to help you create the art. The way we usually do something in color, for example, even just on a, a regular printer, is you would print something, take a look at it, go back to Photoshop, fix it, print it again, see if that works, go back to Photoshop. So just having a color calibrated monitor removes all of those technical steps of just trying to get to the end result you're looking for. So having what you see on the screen be the thing that you uh, can, can print on a printer or even more amazing physically print in 3D, um, removes all of those painful steps. And then you can just, without having to focus on how to get the technology to create the art and it just does it in a, in a fluid way, uh, frees you up to just focus on the art, which is really the reason why all of us got into this field to begin with. So when you kind of combine all of the, the technologies that we've talked about and the, the fact that they're color accurate, and I thank you for, for calling that out. So many people don't realize that they are. You know, we've talked a lot about the physical time-based time, time -based efficiencies. What about the cost efficiencies or the, the waste that, that may or may not be saved? How, how has it impacted that aspect of studio and, and production development? So basically the old adage of, uh, you know, time is money uh, definitely applies to what we do. Uh, every minute that someone is spending time troubleshooting a technical issue instead of doing the art, um, you know, we're, we're losing valuable time and money. So when we're able to uh, streamline our work and really focus on the creative parts of it, that allows us to be um, more competitive um, which means that we can do things for less money for our clients. So we pass that on. Uh, it also means we get to do more of what we enjoy. Uh, and it means that, um, you know, we're, it becomes more lucrative. Um, you know, and all of those things are, are the reason why, uh, you know, it, it generates more work rather than, um, you know, any advancement in technology is going to generate more work, not put people out of work. That's been our experience because, uh, the more work you can do, the more clients you have, the more uh, people come to you for uh, those projects, you know, and the more cost effective you can make it, the more clients you get. Awesome. I think that the advantage is, is iteration. 
because before we would only have a certain amount of iterations to present. And now it gives us this, this latitude to try different things. And that iteration, I think, is where the, the real magic happens. What else stands out to you, Joe, about Wacom products that I definitely don't know? Um, maybe Peter Fund learned something new, but like being on the inside, uh, what stands out to you most? Peter, you might be able to speak more to this, is, is the possibility of not just using it on a virtual production set for uh, rapid iteration, changing a digital model in, in real time in the Unreal Engine, but also as even uh, because they're pen and touch, the, the adoption of using it as almost a control surface for whether that's lighting or, you know, moving around the Unreal Engine. Um, it, it's just another tool in the chest that opens the door to so much other opportunities. And, and once again, Peter, I'd invite you or Fawn to, to, to comment more on, on how you've been using them or how you'd like to see them used. So it's been nice to slowly and but surely kind of uh, never touch the mouse. So it's just sort of like the mouse is there, but I never really liked the mouse. And, um, and uh, so there's something about, you know, cause there's all these like double tap, triple tap and moving things around. And I just like that idea of just like taking a hold of things with my hands. Um, you know, I can move things around a 3D object if I'm examining a set or something like that, and I can move around with using my fingers. And it's just become something that I, is just comfortable and I enjoy it. And then when it's time to like give very specific notes and I wanna draw something for my artists, I just grab the pen. Fun, you, you looked like you wanted to, you were gonna pipe in something as well. Oh, I was just, I was just uh, going to say the, um, one of the, one of the great things that we've noticed with uh, work, working with the tablet and working with the, uh, the stylus is um, it's actually been uh, beneficial in its ergonomics. Uh, we, we've had a lot of, over the decades, a lot of injuries uh, for people doing the kind of repetitive uh, stress disorder on the uh, wrists from, from using the mouse. I actually had to get trained on how to use the mouse not to damage my wrist. Um, because it's a big problem because you're never leaving this nine inch square area, you know? So to have a stylus has really been uh, not just helpful from a creative perspective, but also from a uh, uh, ergonomics perspective. I haven't touched a mouse in 20 years. I, I, I <laughs> but, um, and so I, I will do all my navigational stuff down here to, to your original question, Colton, <laughs> thanks for asking. But um, I do all my navigation down here, but as soon as I go in to do the immersive work, I do a lot of video editing, um, you know, some rotoscoping and I'll immediately go to the Cintiqs for that immersion and, and that precision and the color and all those benefits that come with it. But we've talked about a lot that the Stratasys printers are capable of. What what am I missing? Um, right, so the, this printer that's not actually behind me is the J55, which is what Fawn has at Fawn Co. And uh, the cool thing about it is printing out in full color. So you have cyan, magenta, yellow, black. And then because we aren't printing on paper, we print with white as well. And I guess it's full color, add in clear if you need it. And instead mm. of printing one piece of paper on a 2D printer, you're printing thousands of layers. And that's how we get your part. It's printed with a liquid uh, photopolymer. So it prints out as a liquid, cures into a solid with the UV light. So it's a one-way chemical mm. reaction. Um, there's no way going back. And uh, Fawn, I think, is kind of lucky because he came at the right time with Polyjet, the J55. Um, it really has revolutionized the user interactions and how the machine is serviced. So it means the uptime is incredible. The amount of uh, uh, parts you replace on it is less than any printer we've seen before. And just accessibility into the printer, um, uh, much more intuitive than any printer before it at Stratasys, you know, or otherwise, as far as full color printers go. The, the, the printing that's, uh, that comes out of those things, it's no longer, you're no longer talking photo real, you're talking, oh, it's real, it's right, <laughs> it's right here. That's it. That's awesome. So how long, how long do you think you're living in the Unreal Engine uh, for a, an hour and a half movie, right? Is, are you now in there for a week or is this a month? A um, year. <laughs> what do you, a year. Usually movies don't take a year to shoot. I mean, they, they can, they're, they're about three months to shoot. Um, sometimes they're two months, but um, the, 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 the difference is, is that is the, what we were talking about before about iteration. Instead, about, instead of spending half the day moving the crew from one place to another, I can spend that just doing new, more takes. Sure. Um, and then it's like, okay, now we're 
we're in the bedroom set and then now we want to bring up the living room set well we're in the living room so we're, we're gonna go from the living room to the desert set and then we're gonna go to the spaceship set and it just takes literally a minute and then we're in that new environment and we're ready to go yeah how, how does that compare to striking an entire set and setting up somewhere possibly else it's a totally different <laughs> it's just a completely different animal just getting right. your mind around it is like it's it's just freeing um yes. and it does save quite a bit i mean we were we were doing a cost benefit analysis on a picture um it's a 14 million dollar movie they wanted to shoot it all practically um uh, and we were comparing you know to do it virtually it'd be about twenty thousand dollars per per set uh physically and then for us to do it in engine on the wall it would be um, about five thousand dollars, so that's a significant savings when there's eighty sequence, eighty locations, eighty locations at twenty thousand, and then eighty locations at five thousand each is a significant it's over a million dollars in savings. That's that cost benefit analysis is what everybody really needs to hear to make intelligent decisions. And it's that it's yeah. that's the reason why everyone is going to be making movies this way. Uh, it just, it just, you have to do it this way. It's just so much more inexpensive and faster. And, and also the, um, you know, like Fawn and I had an, an experience when we first started doing the, the sort of pre-imagining, pre-visualizing the movie uh, before the Unreal Engine kind of came into our mindset. We had this idea for this set, uh, this city set that was sort of like, really cool idea it was like this spaceship that was filled with shipping containers crashes and all the sh and thousands of shipping containers roll out of it on mars and then people just started stacking them and creating city blocks and stores and then this whole city is made out of shipping containers and um and so we wanted to do this set and it was going to be very very minimal because we were going to really physically do it with real real shipping containers and then it was like oh well we can do it this way with the unreal engine and all of a sudden it was like Fawn's imagination opened up and it was like, oh, let's do this shot where we could have this. We could, we could never do this before. And this huge vista with thousands of them and we could have multiple layers where we could have parallax through it. And it just opened up and it's like, you know, it's a low budget movie, but all of a sudden we realized we could do something that looked like $200 million movie for maybe like under 10. That, that's insane. That's awesome. I, I want to say now that anyone watching this, be sure to enter your questions in. We're going to soon, in a couple minutes, be to a Q&A with Fawn and Peter. Uh, so please put those in, and we have some moderators that are compiling those questions as we're going. Uh, Joe, do you want to get to the, the last question we've got here? Um, what would you tell people to, to go out and study? What kind of, um, I don't know, what, what advice would you give to a budding artist in your industry? Me or Fawn? <laughs> Let's start with you. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I think just following your obsession over art and film uh, is, because I think we're all kind of in a very competitive industry and you have to work really hard to, to, to you know, meet the other people who are competing for the same positions, right? And, and I think the people who win are the people who it's not work. You just be the full expression of who you are and fought what, no matter how weird or crazy you think that might be and just, you know, get, get into it and you'll find your clan, you'll find the opportunities and you'll get good at what you do because you're doing what you love. So I think that's, I think the ultimate advice I could give and then download the Unreal Engine because it's free. <laughs> <laughs> And fun, what advice would you give? Oh, I would definitely say uh, approach life as a student. You know, getting comfortable in both traditional art and technology is the way you're going to become strongest. I'd say learn as many things about as many departments as you can. Learn as many things in the departments you work in. Uh, because generalists are typically the, the ones that do the best in our industry. Because it means you could jump departments. It means you could jump tasks, you know. Um, uh, when I first started in the industry, everyone was working in one field and they specialized and that's changed a lot over the decades. So, you know, um, I just say diversify your skill set. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. 
Colton, did you have any other questions or shall we move on to the questions and answers from our, from our audience? I, I think we'll move on to the questions and answers from our audience. Uh, one of the first things I want to talk about is, you know, like I said earlier, there is a there is a gift exchange here. Um, we will be contacting uh, two of you uh, with uh, through the email through your registration about these two hundred and fifty dollars three D printing vouchers that uh, we'll be offering up. And I just wanted to make sure we make that announcement before uh, we move into the questions and answers. I also want to encourage people, like we said earlier, please put your questions into the chat so we can uh, address your questions or hopefully you know direct the questions appropriately and, and get that done i also want to uh make sure everybody knows that you know we encourage you to contact both stratasys and wacom on the uh on the back end so if you have questions specifically for either of us or you are interested in evaluations or any of those things please reach out to wacom as well um with that, uh, you would, Colton, would you like to ask the first question or shall I jump on the uh, one that came in from James? In fact, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna take this because it's kind of about both, all of us. Um, when it comes to color printing, is the color, are the color choices more like screen tees, uh, which can actually be obviously very limited, or is it more like laser or inkjet printers? And that one came in from James. Th James, thank you. From a printer side, uh, we can take in files that have a color map assigned to it. So let's say, for example, uh, perfect example, I have an apple, right? And this apple has a geometry, and then it has a color, uh, an image that is wrapped around it with specific coordinates. And that is taking RGB color. And that is how we're assigning color on this part. You can also, in our slicer, you can pick a part and say, I want this part to be this Pantone color or this RGB CMYK color, this mix of different materials. So you can pick colors that way too. Um, but mostly in this workflow, I believe we're talking about color maps over top of these parts. Um, Peter, Joe, Fon, if you've used it in other ways, um, feel free to, to share that as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we basically approach the technology uh, similar to what we would with an inkjet printer. It's just we're working in 3D as far as uh, color choices. We do, um, we are careful to work in CMYK instead of RGB to get, you know, an accurate, um, you know, representation of what we see when we're designing. That's great. Thank you. I I have another question here uh, from Alex. Alex says, uh, kind of directed at Peter and Fun, how do you see the VP integrating into streaming or TV series? And I imagine that VP is virtual production, which are right now outside of many production budgets. Do you feel the use of more um, particles will offset some cost? Because right now your assets like CGI environments, props, cost more than the daily rate of most VP studios. Um, you know, the, the thing that makes uh, virtual production interesting uh, for independent filmmakers is things like the, uh, the, the, the marketplace, the epic marketplace. They sell a lot of the assets that you require that you can use in virtual production. So that's what makes it more accessible to independent filmmakers. Of course, keeping in mind that if you want custom environments, you know, those are still going to be very high end, very uh, expensive to create because you have to pay all the artists, of course, to create uh, unique environments. Uh, but if, you, if you're willing to work within the, the uh, boundaries of purchased uh, models and things like that, there's a lot available. Um, and then also, you know, I think that the most expensive part of virtual production right now is uh, access to an LED wall. I would imagine over time that'll get less expensive, but there is also software that can track the camera in real time, just like a, a LED volume um use utilizing a green screen so you can actually preview on a monitor what you see in a in a virtual environment uh and how it's going to composite into your scene how the lighting will kind of look in that so on so that for independent filmmakers that's probably the technology i would recommend over uh trying to have gain access to an led wall but by all means if you can get an led wall um they're amazing to work with the uh there's another technique, not just the, when people think of virtual production, they think the wall, the LED wall. And uh, that's the sexy thing, you know, that's the new toy. Uh, but um, 
there's another technique uh, other than what Fawn is talking about, which is real-time compositing, um, where you shoot on a sound stage and you, the camera is hooked up to the Unreal Engine, so you're creating parallax simultaneously. Um, there's another technique, and we've been utilizing it on another show that Ronan Film is doing right now called the Taro. And that's, a, I call it real-time compositing, but it's a different type, which is you shoot on a green screen, and then you take that footage, not live, but pre-recorded, you remove the green, and as an alpha channel, you import it into the Unreal Engine. This is great for any production, but especially for low budget productions um, or student productions, no budget filmmaking kind of thing like that. Uh, it's very easy to shoot on a green screen. Colton, you're on a green screen right now. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, you, you understand where your lighting sources are, so you want to mimic that in the Unreal Engine. So say, well, we have a scene that takes place in a church. Uh, we uh, Super low budget. We couldn't afford to shoot in a church. Um, and also we changed the church in a very unique way. So it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars to shoot this way. We just got a church on uh, CG Trader for $45. And we art directed it. And then we filled it with metahumans which are also free on the Unreal Engine. And then we filmed a guy uh, on a pulpit, you know, preaching. And we made sure that we shot it from different angles that we were then going to place him. So we take a 2D video card. So the, the video is playing uh, alpha channel around him. So it's, it's just the guy. We sized him to appropriate in the place. The angle was appropriate for the angle for the digital camera and the Unreal Engine, match the lighting. And then we were able to do interesting camera moves as well. And the parallax was correct because he's literally in that space. And then you export the shot and it's done. So there's no compositing per se, real-time compositing. Uh, and that's a technique that uh, we've been using and uh, it's been very effective and it's very, very affordable and very, very fast. That's, that's exactly what people need to hear. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's about the speed, the efficiency and the quality that you end up with. I mean, right. I mean, it's, it's about, if, if it wasn't quality, you wouldn't be doing it. So it's then it turns into that fast, cheap and good combo that, that doesn't exist anywhere, but you've found it. Um, so definitely the holy grail. Go, what was that? The holy grail? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the holy grail. You know, no, you can't really have fast and cheap and, good uh, all at the same time, but this way you really can. That's that's exactly what we like to hear. Um, Colton, did you want to ask that one from Sean first? Uh, we're trying sure. to manage time and questions. Um, I, I kind of think that one just flows a little bit more naturally into the, the conversation that was just had. So let's let's yeah. run with that one. Yeah, so Sean is asking, uh, you've mentioned a lot of physical versus virtual work and back and forth. What new interfaces have you been using? So he sees tablets and dials and the videos. Are you also using VR, DMX? Are there ways you're using old tools and new ways? And how do you customize your Wacom tablet interfaces for virtual production? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> and, and mostly, I think um, the thing that stands out to me most is that old tools and new ways. Right. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could only speak to, um, you know, our department, how we utilize the tools in the art department. We do customize a lot of the buttons. Um, you know, that, that's an artist to artist um, kind of uh, preference, though. So that's, that's one of the greatest things about having the programmable buttons on the tablets or on the Cintiq is uh, you can make them whatever uh, commands you utilize the most. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, <laughs> but uh, that's how we utilize the uh, customization of the buttons and things. Um, and the, the rest of it is just being able to work, um, you know, in a very natural feeling way, you know, in, in terms of creating um, illustrations and sculptures and um, even just moving things around within the Unreal environment. It's just like picking things up and dropping them, you know, it's it just comes very naturally. I know that, that our team uh, doing CGI, working with the Unreal Engine, we don't just work with the Unreal Engine, we're working with Maya 
and we're working with 3D Studio Max, and we're and we're uh, uh, kind of toggling between multiple programs. They all kind of center in with the Unreal Engine, but I know that our team uses the Cintiq, and they have programmable buttons that are allow them. I think one of the one of the most powerful ways was the the stylus has programmable buttons so that you can do the same uh, function in Maya and also in the Unreal Engine, even though they're different programs doing the same. So natively, you have to use these key, these these key uh, these keys that are different, and so you have to kind of as an artist, you have to wrap around, Oh, what program I am I right now? Like, am I am I doing uh, like a, a you can you can do well. It's, it's that's hard to explain. Anyway, I'm not. I'm I'm directing it. They're they're actually doing it. But they they toggle between multiple programs using the, and they program these uh, their their Cintiq and their and their uh, uh, their stylus to uh, to be universal. So it's, I know I know that they're very happy with that streamlined approach. That's awesome, Joe. Uh, I've got a question specifically about the Wacom products. And Mark is asking, are you able to get the angle data of the pen uh, into Unreal Engine or anything else? Or you could use as a lever or something. <laughs> so the, that's a double-edged question. And, and, and honestly, I, I kind of want to build on a little bit of what, what Peter was just going on about the, the, the concept of your pen having common themes as you move from one place to the next may not be the same keyboard shortcut, but we've, we've actually really focused on giving you all the rope you need to hang yourself, um, but in a good way. So, I mean, you, you can make these things do just about anything. Um, and, and to that end, that angle data is available in the Unreal Engine. The question is, has anybody, you know, leveraged or created the tools uh, to, to take advantage of it? You know, um, there is so much you can add to create for uh, open source stuff that you can get into Unreal. Um, yes, that information is there. I've seen some really amazing things done um, by people who've just decided to create their own bells and whistles for any number of applications. One of my favorites uh, was uh, the godfather of sound design, Ben Burt, um, created or had created a a whole interface for the voice modulation using the X, Y coordinates as well as pressure and tilt on the pen. And that's how he created Wally's voice. So, I mean, the information's all there. The questions, um, you know, are you are you up to the task of hiring somebody to make that accessible and used in the best way possible? And I wanna encourage people to go crazy, um, you know, create tools that, that really get taken advantage of in Unreal. I mean, the, there's no bottom end. It's it's limited only by your creativity. Um, thank you for that question. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> um, I, I want to kind of jump back to, you know, some of the conversations that we were having earlier. And this one's a convoluted-ish question, but I see James was having a trouble in, in really how to articulate it. So I will I'll put it out there. When going through ideas for movies, knowing you can create them physically, uh, are, are less ideas ending up on the cutting room floor? And I, I kind of want to stop the question there uh, just to kind of see what you guys come up with. But he, he talks about, you know, problems with the physics and, um, you know, certain things about how, you know, let's see, I know how certain ideas aren't able to be done due to physics, as well as how it would be made or from what it would be made. Thinking of things like Batman's suit and how it was stiff. Um, you know, basically, is the, the ability, I think his question is, is the ability that you can so rapidly iterate keeping things from ending up on the cutting room floor? How about if I frame it that way? Um, um, I would say that through the years, we've definitely um, created an environment uh, within motion pictures that I guess we do less iteration. I guess, it, you know, it depends. It, like in the design phase, that we, we do what's called blue skies. And so we really want to explore all visual options. Once we start production on a movie, we want to end the blue sky phase and we want to just create the things and those things do end up on the screen. Um, because we are relying on technology and animation and a lot of different uh, departments and variables, it does get uh, expensive very quickly. So 
I think through the use of animatics and really good planning, uh, we've actually eliminated the need to have things end up on the cutting room floor in terms of uh, visual effects. We're just very, very careful at being deliberate in creating those visual effects and those scenes so that, um, you know, I don't, I don't feel like there's a lot that ends up on the cutting room floor. We, we don't do a lot of extra. <laughs> we don't do a lot of redoing of things. It's, it's, we really try to put in the planning so we can get it right the first time. Um, and, you know, um, and it, to be fair, we also have a lot of ability to adjust things as we go because we are working with computers. Um, with that said, um, you know, the stuff that still does work, uh, end up on the cutting room floor is usually different takes with uh, actors. <laughs> because you do want those different iterations and that's where, you know, the performance of the storytelling really has to come through. And so you want to give your actors a, a, an opportunity to kind of warm up sometimes and do different variations on a scene. And you might not know until you get into editing what's the correct scene for the movie. But uh, as far as visual effects go, there's not a lot of uh, waste, I would say. Thank you. I'm going to ask this one of Colton. <laughs> what's the physical size of the Stratasys? <laughs> Easy. Uh, so the, the Stratasys J55 is what uh, Fawn and Peter have been working with. That is a printer that's come up about a year ago. It is the smallest, most cost-effective full-color 3D printer that we have. Um, it is, you know, I mean, from a virtual background, but it is uh, behind me in the virtual background that is representative size. So it's about a meter and a half tall. So the, the top half of that is um, about sitting on a 32 inch table. The bottom half of it is the materials, top half of it is the, the printing components. Um, there are printers of this that we have the same technology, but they are bigger, so you can print larger parts. You can also have seven materials instead of five. Uh, but th this printer is designed to be quiet, small footprint, um, and not smell. So it is perfect for uh, an environment where people are, are working next to it in, in a design space, in a production environment, uh, or in a um, special effects uh, um, studio, right? Where, where people are working around it all the time. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for Peter and Fun. How much do you think this technology will impact the indie world? That kind of lines up with the next question. Well, I, I, think next question. I think it's, I think it's, it's most effective in the indie world in that used to be if you had a limited budget, you'd have to make uh, My Dinner with Andre, which is about two guys talking in a restaurant for two hours. And, uh, and so, or Clerks, which is, you know, two locations. It was, is, it was relegated to whatever you could afford, to sh uh, whatever you had access to. So if you had a video store that you worked at, you could shoot there and then you could make your movie. So the, the choices were, very, very narrow uh, because most people aren't millionaires. And so uh, the the access to, and the Unreal Engine working on a regular Lenovo with uh, with a, uh, a uh, uh, oh my God, I blanked on our, uh, uh, on our uh, technology, but uh, these tools that we have um, are, are relatively affordable and, if you can't afford to buy them, someone you know has them. So uh, the the idea is that you could shoot a movie on on your green screen in your living room, and then all of a sudden you're, um, you know, in a in the ocean or you're in a big castle, or you could have any location that you want. Um, so that that sort of that's the biggest change is that you your imagination now can be fulfilled. Whereas before you'd have to be anointed by Hollywood to do a multi-million dollar movie that can have a giant spaceship or, you know, some people would just gravitate to certain genres. Like Fawn and I are both sci-fi fantasy fans and we love working on them and we love watching them. And of course they cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's like, if we wanna go and make something like that, we have to work for the studios. Um, but then of course, you've got a million of these executives that tell you what to do. So when you watch one of these big movies, like an Avengers movie, uh, there's no singular voice. There's a bunch of executives that are telling the writer or director what to do. So a lot of times these movies kind of have 
um, no singular voice. And what's great about independent filmmaking is there's a singular voice. It's often not a popular point of view. It's a very unique perspective and it's consistent. And that's why independent filmmaking can be really some of the most exciting films that you can see. Uh, Cause the, you have that unique independent voice, no, no kitchens, uh, cook, too many cooks in the kitchen kind of thing. So to, for a filmmaker to have an independent point of view, but paint a story on a large canvas has been almost unknown, right? We don't know that in uh, the viewing audience uh, history of filmmaking. It's happened a couple times, like uh, Apocalypse Now is a very unique, independent vision shot on 70 millimeter um, with a gigantic spectacle. And it was the only reason why was because Francis Coppola had won the Oscar for Godfather One, Godfather Part Two, had a lot of money and had the resources and went to, um, you know, Southeast Asia and made his, his personal movie and um, on a gigantic canvas. So there was no studio involved in tinkering with the story. It was his vision. Um, you know, Citizen Kane is another example of that where you had a, a director who had Final Cut who had huge canvas to paint on. I mean, Citizen Kane is a very huge movie, but he had director's cut. so. He, he was able to tell the story he wanted to tell, but it was on a very large canvas. So we've had very few examples of this throughout the last hundred years of cinema. And now all of a sudden, somebody with a couple hundred dollars can go ahead and make their little tiny independent movie in their backyard, but it can feel like Lawrence of Arabia. And that is the biggest change in art, you know, in our, in our art form uh, ever. It's probably the most significant change more important than the advent of sound, color. Um, and this is very, very significant. Yeah, it's, it's a democratization, right? It's It's been awesome to watch in a very short amount of time, similar to what happened to music, right? Just recently with, or, you know, YouTube. I, I, I wanna kind of take that and move forward five years. So I'm doing this on behalf of Jimmy who actually asked the question. Uh, where do you see this technology taking us in five years? And, and whoever wants to jump on this one first. Um, we have to... uh, <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, that's a that's a big question, actually. Um, you know, I, I would imagine that, uh, you know, I think LED walls in particular are going to eventually replace green screens as they become more cost effective, as they become more affordable for uh, more filmmakers. I think that uh, the use of virtual production is only going to increase. I think it's going to take um, artists that don't get so excited about the technology that they use it just to use the technology and they stick to storytelling. You know, um, you know, so it, if enough artists start using the technology to tell really great stories, you know, that, that um, really... Uh, people can identify with, people can enjoy without getting too crazy about just the technology. I think that that's going to really drive the interest in using it for storytelling, because at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We're telling stories, you know, so um, I think as that happens more, it's just going to explode. It's going to become more popular. Um, I, I would hope that uh, <laughs> um, uh, people would come to our studio with more than $200. <laughs> So, yes, if you're making a movie in your backyard, by all means, uh, you can do it for $200. I would never say anything like that uh, about a professional production ever. Um, that might pay for your lunch that day with your crew, and that's about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I do, I do think it'll become more affordable. I do think it will expand the uh, amount of work we do with technology as it has expanded since the 90s. Um, you know, it's, it's very exciting to kind of see where it'll go. And I think that there are aspects of the technology that there's no way we can predict um, because it's really going to be driven by artists. And artists, of course, have uh, limitless perspectives on how they utilize this stuff. So it's going to be very fun. I don't even know what we'll be I doing know in a year. <laughs> technology. <laughs> I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to see, you know, when I say $200, I'm talking about kids 
you know, kids making movies in their backyard. And, um, and the tomorrow's filmmakers are the kids making movies in their backyard today. And so just like any other art form, if you wanna learn how to draw a portrait or uh, if you wanna learn how to write a song, you have a lot of really shitty art in you that you have to kind of get out of the way. And it takes a thousand hours to perfect something. And so um, you can't just decide you wanna be a filmmaker and then someone hands you a budget and then you go make your Hollywood movie. You have to make a hundred shitty $200 movies in your backyard. What allows you, what's great about this is that in the history of filmmaking, every single nobody who becomes a somebody has been making those little backyard movies. And they have have been limited to the genre uh, of, of film that they could do, which is just people talking, which is great because people talk in movies and it's a bunch of talking heads mostly. But there's um, if you have an, an imagination that allows you to take something, a story that is on another world or Mars or uh, uh, underground caverns or wherever you want, uh, you want to shoot, a, you have a story to tell that's in the Grand Central Station and you can't go there. Well, you can go there with a phone uh, and using LIDAR, you can scan the Grand, Grand Central Station and you can scan it exactly the way it is, put it in the Unreal Engine, and then you can make your movie in the Grand, in Grand Central Station. Uh, you'd never be able to do that otherwise. And so it does open the door to young filmmakers to be able to experiment on the canvas that we, that Fawn paints on as a professional um, all the time. And uh, so that that's really exciting. And for, for professionals to be able to go and do that extra location that they wanted to do or have the set be a little bit bigger or much bigger. Uh, so it affects everybody, um, but I, I'm, Personally, as the, the young filmmaker that I am, some more hiding inside of my brain, uh, you know, I was making movies as a kid, and I, that's that person, that young person is still inside of me, and I still have the same kind of giddy excitement about making movies. And the young people out there that are that are just starting their filmmaking journey, it's like the best time to be part of this art form. Thanks for the clarification there, Peter. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, a, there's, well, you know, just speaking as a professional that runs a studio, um, you know, we try to compensate our artists uh, and give them a living wage. So we, we try to be careful of our messaging in terms of cost and not get too, um, how do you say, optimistic about what these things cost. Because it is, it is less expensive than it used to be, but it still requires a budget. So. That's an important thing to know from this angle. <laughs> it, it's it's right. the backyard learning films, educational. You're getting your buddies together. That's the three hundred dollar film. That um, is, and, yes. And in five years, <laughs> speaking from like a printing technology as well, what you can do with full color three D printing, as far as the number of of nozzles on a printer that we have jetting out these these resins, is amazing. But in five years, what I see uh, us going towards, and hopefully it's going to help Fawn and Peter, is getting even a better workflow. So meeting the the um, designer where they are, and this could be in product design, it could be in film, um, wherever it is, to bring those meshes. Uh, more seamlessly to print. So no matter if you have open meshes, if you are, didn't even design a volume as part, if we can you know, make that just work and you don't need to think about how do I design for 3D printing, um, it, it just takes care of it for you. That's where we are headed in the next five years is a more streamlined workflow. Uh, the next question is, can you design parametrically with these tools and methods, kind of like you would in SOLIDWORKS, as opposed to squishing, squashing a, a mesh around? Uh, great question for Joe as uh, input devices and Peter and Fawn, do you guys design parametrically or is it all um, you know, with meshes? Um, you know, that's funny. That's, um, you know, that's, that's funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't actually do the digital sculpting. I'm still old school. I use clay. <laughs> but I sit right next to one of my concept artists that uses uh, ZBrush, and I'm pretty sure he does um, utilize the, the Cintiq for uh, parametric um, sculpting. Yeah, I mean, to, to build on that, our tools are used everywhere. I mean, the tablets were originally digitizers to begin with. They, they still kind of have that nomaker under the hood. Um, 
these are basically big digitizers behind displays. And so they're, they're really designed to fit SolidWorks and, and there's nothing that keeps you from printing something designed in, in SolidWorks, AutoCAD or anything. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just a matter of converting it to the right file type and you can, you can be off to the races. Um, I mean, that's at least that's how I see it anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I've been asked, uh, where would I be able to get more information about uh, the SDK for the pen? Um, we're going to add that if we if we haven't already added it to the chat. Um, that 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 information is out there. We have developer support, and I encourage you to go out, sign up, and and ask the questions. What we need more than anything, other than more of these young artists creating films, are young talent creating. Uh, new methods of input into Unreal or new tools that can do what, you know, the, the, the crazy artists who are coming up with brilliant ideas need in order to create the next best thing. There, I go back to, you're only limited by your imagination, make the tool. Um, and that, that developer support is there for you to help make that tool. Um, <laughs> and will we see a Wacom Unreal Engine webinar? I love the question. I can't make a promise, but I can promise that we will look into it because I think it's a brilliant idea. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, Colton, I'm going to ask this one of you first because I think you're really the, 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 the mind behind it. How deep does the color go into the parts from the, from the J55? Um, reason for asking is the parts need to be sanded for modeling and all that. Um, are you going to expose a base material or is it actually a depth? Sure. Great question. So the color uh, with our latest color materials is either a half a millimeter or one millimeter thick, depending on if you need clear or not. If you need clear, it's going to be a millimeter thick because you don't actually have black. You're making a, a programmed or synthetic black. Uh, otherwise, just half a millimeter thick. So yeah, it's not really thin. If you sand off, you're going to start losing some of that color. Behind the color is uh, a white base. Uh, think about if you're printing on paper, you have a white paper, you can print on top of that. So you need a white base, you have opacity and, and a start as far as your CMYK color profile. Um, but there is still a solution for that. So you're talking about sanding off uh, the, the color on your part. If you know you're going to be sanding your part to uh, get a better surface finish, you can add a clear shell around it. Our program will actually let you do that automatically. You can bring your geometry into the, the slicing of the slicer with color on the outside and say, oh, I need a polishing layer and I, I need uh, 0.1 millimeters of polishing or 0.6 millimeters of polishing. And that's going to put a clear shell around the outside of your part uh, relative to how much you think you're going to need to sand away and polish. So that way, when you sand off that outer, let's say 0.2 millimeters of material, you haven't actually removed any of the color. You are just now taking off some of that clear, and now you're left with a perfectly smooth um, uh, finish on your part, ready to either polish or clear coat. So I hope that answered the question. We have like uh, the next question. That. Yeah. Oh, Colton, I'd like to add to that, actually, uh, having worked with uh, the J55 um, quite a bit, the, uh, you know, just something to know, the parts come out with a very, very, very high quality and require very, very little sanding. So, um, you know, I know working with FDM printers and a lot of uh, the lower quality printers, there's a lot of sanding and cleanup to do. I will say that these machines don't require as much cleanup. And that's something that people would be interested to know. Absolutely. And nobody better so, to say it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean the same thing if I say it. So the polish no. <laughs> machines, they have a, a layer resolution of about 18 microns, as opposed to FDM, which is much more, you can count each layer and polish it. You'd have to get magnifying glass out and then you'll start to see them, but you still can't count them. So like this apple that I held up earlier, uh, you know, this is straight out of the, the printer with the support removed. This is not uh, clear coat or anything. I have some sitting in the other room that have clear coat and then like a sticker from a real apple and that just puts it over the and top. That, so that is, that that is not the a real apple. Way this is not a real apple. No, this is uh, this is 3D printed. So yeah. we got an Artec recently. Awesome. I've been playing around with our Artec scanner uh, to kind of mimic what you see in real life. Uh, we had a bowl of fruit where we had, yes. we had totally a bowl of fruit in this yeah. bowl. And one of them was a real fruit. So you ask somebody which one of those fruit is real. And it takes a while to kind of hunt around and find it. So there and we are. Really in five cool. years, back to that question, in five years, yeah. I expect Miracle. a replicator where I can eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Won't taste edible resin. Good. There it is, Colton. <laughs> yeah. Edible resin. There we go. Plant-based plant resin. 
I think uh, we have one question questions. left. Yeah, yeah go for it. Well. Uh, do we foresee some of the venues being made digitally available for individuals to utilize who don't have LIDAR units and travel budgets to capture those locations? So if you're in, let's say, Australia and you can't get to Grand Central Station to do the scan of it, I imagine maybe there are some well-known venues that are already uh, you know, online available. I know the Smithsonian does a lot of scans of artifacts and like the, the space um, uh, um, rockets and things they've scanned some of those but peter and fawn you guys know of other other ways to get maybe some uh, some objects that are pop culture you know know what they are fawn fawn's company uses uh our tech scanners uh for the miniatures and then um oh, we would also been for background uh uh, actors or background props and things that are not really high resolution. We've been just using iPhones to uh, to do photogrammetry on on. But you know, Fawn can talk about that. And Fawn, yeah, there's, there's actually in, there. there's... in in your answer, do you have a, a your favorite iPhone app for photogrammetry? I'd love to know that. I think just you just have to get the new iPhone uh, 12 Pro, isn't it? Or maybe the 11 Pro also has it. But it has a. a I forget. Oh, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> we have a. We have been using two different ones, and I can't remember what they are right now. If anyone's watching, on our team, that can kind of uh, give me a note here. But uh, there are two different ones that we've been using. Um, they have uh, the app has a website, so you you do the scan, then you send the data to the website, and then they in a half an hour they spit out um, the three D model. Can't remember which, what, but they both work great, and I, I can't remember what, what it is. Yeah. So we. Yeah, but there's actually that, a that lot of scanner, Go ahead. It, it, maybe Fawn can talk about that Artec scanner a little bit. I mean, it's pretty um, high tech. Yeah, it's it's um, uh, basically it, it does its own internal photogrammetry. Uh, but it, it takes a bunch of shots and then it uh, builds a computer model for you. And it also captures the texture while you do it. Um, so, you know, you end up with a model with the textures. Um, it's very convenient. You just kind of hold, it's a handheld. So you just kind of walk it around your part and you can build um, in, in kind of puzzle piece, uh, different scans together to create a larger object. Um, we've uh, utilized it to create miniatures and bring them into Unreal. Um, we've also utilized them, as you saw in the documentary, just in creating props or, um, you know, for us, it's, it's extremely valuable to be able to 3D scan something and then um, get it into uh, modeling software so we can build things that, that mesh with that real object and then 3D print those and then they, of course, fit perfectly. So there's a lot of um, back and forth between uh, working in the computer and working in the real world and that 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 combination of uh, traditional art and technology is extremely powerful. So the art tech is definitely a part of that workflow. And, it's and called go, Mesh Room. M-E-S-H-R-O-O-M. That's the low cost or free version that you can do with your iPhone. Yeah, and, and going to the less expensive solutions for that that question, there's there's all sorts of libraries out there for kit bashing, um, you know, your 3D environments, your 3D models, uh, and that library is growing, you know, by gigs, terabytes every day. So that that's something to also keep in mind that these, you know, when you start talking about five years out or even next year or even now, there's more out there than you could possibly imagine. That's that's accessible and, and a much more reasonably priced than trying to fly there and, and scan it yourself. Um, so obviously, check the resources first. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot and, on the uh, Epic uh, Games Marketplace. Oh, the library there is huge. It's crazy. Yeah, it's insane. Um, I will go ahead and ask the last question. Uh, it's it's a little bit of a trick question because I don't know how we can really answer it here and now, but I love the fact that it's being asked, which is I'm an adjunct professor building a, a virtual production stage at the um, and the corresponding curriculum at HBCU University, where he teaches or where I teach. I'd love to add the Wacom and Stratasys tools to, to our plans for the pipeline we're teaching. 
Do we have a partnership program with colleges? I love the idea. Um, if so, how can we get involved? Well, I would say we need to, Colton, we need to keep our companies talking. Uh, I think that's the agenda anyway. Um, but I don't think we have a solid answer now, but I would, uh, do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, so at Stratasys, we do partner with universities to provide a 3D printing Stratasys cer uh, certification program. So that includes all the curriculum around 3D printing technologies as a whole, you know, not just Stratasys centric, but as a whole for, for um, 3D printing curriculum. We do partner with that way. Uh, I am, I'm going to see if I can reach out to you for your email address. Otherwise, if you go to our, uh, go to our website, stratasys.com, enter in the chat that you're either trying to get in contact with the um, education expert or just put Colton Melhoff in there, you know, we'll get connected and and uh, I'll connect you with the person that manages that education curriculum for universities. Um, and I, there might be more that goes along with that, but yeah, we do have a program in place. That is a great segue into our ending slide because we've abused everybody's time. Uh, we've gone 20 minutes over, but it's been a great conversation. So I thank you at all. Um, we will, we will post right here, uh, how to get in touch with both of us, all of us. Um, like I said, we are working together so you can come through either or both. I encourage you to, to reach out to both. And I want to thank Peter and Fawn so much. This has been so fun, so insightful. Uh, you know, it's always great to be able to, to, to get great minds together. Not that I'm contributing much. Uh, but it's been so fun having you on board. So thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank and, you guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, thank Colton. you. Yeah, thank Joe. you. Absolutely our pleasure.